tonight. Brexit begins today. Stopping cops from snatching property. And the series scandalizing black colleges. North Carolina has less than 24 hours to repeal its so-called bathroom bill, or the NCAA won't allow the state to host championship games for the next five years. House Bill 2's hostility toward transgender people led to widespread protests and corporate boycotts projected to cost North Carolina billions in lost business. New Jersey Governor Chris Christie's former aides and allies were sentenced to prison today for their roles in the Bridgegate scandal. In 2013, they colluded to close lanes on the George Washington Bridge in the town of a mayor who didn't endorse Christie. Bill Baroni got two years in prison and Bridget Ann Kelly got a year and a half. Christie was never charged and swears he didn't know about the plan. The head of U.S. Central Command told Congress today that he believes Russia is working with the Taliban in Afghanistan to increase its regional influence. I think they are much more concerned about ISIS and the potential that has to move into the Central Asian states and potentially have an impact on them. So they have created a created a narrative that uh, you really have to uh, partner more with the Taliban to address this particular threat. Six people who work at the American Embassy in Kabul, most of them U.S. citizens, have been fired for using or selling drugs on the premises. The U.S. has spent billions of dollars on anti-drug operations in Afghanistan. Afghanistan's opium poppy production goes into more than 90% of heroin worldwide. The Senate Intelligence Committee gave an update on its Russia investigation today. It's requested interviews from 20 people, including Jared Kushner, and is close to finishing a review of thousands of pages of documents. Russia's goal, Vladimir Putin's goal, is a weaker United States, and that should be a concern to all Americans, regardless of party affiliation. This morning, the British government handed the European Union a letter signed by Prime Minister Theresa May that invokes Article 50, giving the EU formal notice that the UK wants out. This is an historic moment from which there can be no turning back. There is no reason to, to pretend that this is a happy day, neither in Brussels nor in London. Britain now has a two-year deadline to leave the EU. But the negotiations are going to be extremely complicated, and things could get messy fast. Aditya Chakraborty explains. You might have heard that the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, has begun divorce proceedings. A long and noisy argument. Not quite. She's actually started two long and noisy arguments. The first is a bit like a divorce. You might call it the biggest divorce in history, with no fewer than 28 partners haggling over who gets to keep what. And nobody sat around a table has ever done anything like this before. Europe wants Britain to pick up a $65 billion bill on its way out for previously agreed spending. The biggest item of all is what happens to the million odd Britons living in the rest of the EU and the 3 million EU citizens residing in Britain. Theresa May plans to trade the rights of one group for the other, and under Article 50, all this stuff has to be worked out by March 2019. However emotional, divorces are nowhere near as messy as sorting custodial rights, and the Brexit equivalent is fixing a new trade deal. Britain needs one fast, so it can keep selling its cars, whiskey and financial services to 700 million Europeans with minimal hassle. Ministers talk of getting this entirely new trading relationship up within just two years. But think, it took Canada and Europe seven years to sort out their recent trade agreement. This will be the first trade round in which the most likely outcome will be not more commerce, but less. Theresa May says she wants a frictionless borders with Europe for which her European counterparts will demand Britain opens its doors to EU migrants. So the other card May played today was to mention terrorism. No trade deal, she said, meant no security deal. Our cooperation in the fight against crime and terrorism would be weakened. Now that's an extraordinary threat. Give us a deal or risk your citizens' safety. One crucial thing to bear in mind over the next few months. Theresa May is pushing through a policy that she doesn't actually believe in. 
barely gets a mention now, but last summer's referendum, she backed Britain staying in the EU. Presumably, she believed then that leaving would be a big mistake. Today, however, she sounded as die-hard as the rest of the Brexit brigade. A new poll shows what Britons miss most about being a fully autonomous country. 36% say that when Brexit is complete, they'd like to bring back the death penalty. 31% miss the old blue passports. And 30% want to return to listing product weight in pounds and ounces instead of kilograms. It's a reflection of how thoroughly EU statutes and regulations change the details of British life. Now the question is, how do they change them back? Countries are supposed to keep a handle on important things, like how many laws they have on the books. But as Britain prepares to exit the European Union, it has a problem. No one really knows how many EU laws became British laws. One estimate says more than 20,000. High-powered vacuum cleaners, the amount of cocoa in a chocolate bar, and the cleanliness of beaches. All these things are currently regulated in Britain by EU laws. But some of these EU regulations are merely irritating, like requiring Britons to tick a box on every web page to accept cookies, or banning bent bananas from being classified as grade A. Others, like the so-called tampon tax that requires Britain to tax women's sanitary products, are more infuriating. But there are plenty of areas where the Brits and the Europeans will still be tangled up on hugely important issues. EU membership denies the British government any control over the number of European migrants who come to the UK seeking work. Striking that law down could have huge reciprocal effects on British citizens. So could ditching the common fisheries policy, which gives European fleets equal access to the waters of all EU states within 12 nautical miles of shore and imposes quotas to preserve fish stocks. Then there's the EU's Working Time Directive, which makes it illegal for people to work more than an average of 48 hours per week. Changes there could cause mayhem. To start addressing its legal confusion, the British government is first planning to pass a bill that formally makes all current EU law British law. Then lawmakers will go through the legal appendix line by line, stripping out the EU laws they don't want, which would then be challenged in Parliament and the British courts. Eventually, Britain will once again have its own set of laws. Who will be overseeing them by then is anyone's guess. There are more than 20 members of the House of Representatives who could make a claim to be a scientist. Congressman Lamar Smith, chairman of the House Committee on Science, Space and Technology, is not one of them. Today, Smith's committee held a hearing to question the quote, methods and implications of climate science, effectively putting it on trial. Much of climate science today appears to be based more on exaggerations, personal agendas, and questionable predictions than on the scientific method. So how much does Lamar Smith know about science? Ariel Duem Ross reports. Lamar Smith always wanted to be a scientist. At the Christian military academy he attended outside of San Antonio, he was named most courteous and most industrious. There, he won the Bausch and Loam Science Award and had early aspirations to study physics. But Smith went to law school instead, where he edited the school newspaper. In 1981, he became a state rep, serving on two science-ish committees in Austin, the Energy Resources Committee and the Fire Ants in Texas Committee, which is a real thing. Five years later, he was elected to Congress, where he served quietly until politics finally merged with his passion in 2012, when House Speaker John Boehner named Smith chairman of the Science, Space and Technology Committee, which controls $40 billion in federal agency budgets. Incidentally, the donations that Smith received from the oil and gas industry nearly doubled after his appointment. As chairman, Smith has been pro-funding for space exploration and against just about everything else. Like many Republicans, he's no fan of the EPA. But what's strange is that he's often hostile to science itself. It's been 21 years since a former science committee issued just one subpoena. Uh, so the 25th one that I signed a couple of weeks ago uh, made me feel very good about how active and proactive the committee has been. This afternoon, the House voted to approve one of Smith's bills, known as the Honest Act, 
The act would, ironically, limit the EPA's ability to make regulations based on science from peer-reviewed studies in the world's most well-respected journals. Today's hearing wasn't the climate equivalent of the Scopes Monkey trial, but there were some heated exchanges, most notably with Michael Mann, the climate scientist famous for the hockey stick graph in Al Gore's documentary, An Inconvenient Truth. According to an article that came out a few days ago in the journal Science, uh, Chairman Smith was on record at the Heartland Institute. This is a climate change denying Koch brothers funded uh, outlet um, that has a climate change denier conference every year. And uh, Dr. Chairman Mann, Smith don't spoke mischaracterize that. Well, let me let me finish uh, my. No, they do not say that they are deniers, and you should not say that they are either. Well, uh, we we can have that discussion. I'd be happy to. Let well, me finish. Be my accurate statement. in your description. Well, but Smith was eager to put on a show, calling three witnesses who questioned climate science. Let's make scientific debate about climate change great again. Congressman Smith has repeatedly denied our request for an interview or comment. Today, our latest request was also denied. A law enforcement tactic called civil asset forfeiture allows officers to seize property, like cars or money, from anyone suspected of committing a crime. It's a useful tool for federal agents fighting drug cartels. But a new report from the Inspector General at the U.S. Department of Justice raises concerns about local police who work with federal task forces using the same tactic without proper training. In states like Texas, there are already growing complaints about asset forfeiture, and the issue is uniting two groups who don't usually get along, lawbreakers and conservative politicians. Office. I got arrested back in March of 2016, and y'all are um, trying to seize my vehicle. Um, I was just wondering um, where my vehicle is now. I could tell you where it went back then, but I couldn't tell you for sure where it is now. It's been so long. But I'll give you the number to the county attorney's office. Okay. Um, they'll have information about it. In March of 2016, Mindy says she was pulled over in Lampasas, Texas for flashing her brights but that instead of issuing a ticket, the cop searched her car. What did he say when he came up to the car? Um, I smell marijuana. And what happened after they searched the car? Well, they found the two resin balls and they first tried to um, charge me with heroin. <laughs> and then I was like, open the bag and smell it, it's marijuana. And then he, he did it and he looked at it and he's like, oh, it's hash. Mindy swears it was weed. The cops insist it was hash. But this isn't about how Mindy likes to get high. It's about her 2004 Jeep Cherokee, which the state of Texas is fighting in court. I didn't even have enough for, like, to sell. I had no baggies, no scale, nothing in the car and that would indicate that. Here's my dogs. I take them to Bull Creek all the time. The Jeep was big. They like to get in it. I could put the seats down. After the cops took her car, Mindy couldn't get to work and eventually lost her job as a personal assistant. With no money coming in, she had to move out of her apartment and sleep on friends' couches. It's been a year and she still doesn't have her Jeep back. The sheriff's department took Mindy's car through something called civil asset forfeiture, which allows law enforcement to seize property without actually convicting anyone of a crime. It dates back to the 1700s when it was used to seize ships transporting illegal goods. In 1978, Congress expanded the practice so officers could hold on to drug money. They expanded it again in 1984 so cars, homes, and all other private property would be fair game. Today, law enforcement say it's the most effective way to fight cartel leaders, who are really good at covering their tracks. Making it more difficult for law enforcement to seize large amounts of the cartel's money only benefits the cartel's illegal enterprise. We don't want to help the cartel. We want to help the citizens and law enforcement. Sheriff Evanson doesn't have to deal with the cartels very often. He's the sheriff of Rockwall County, which is about 200 miles from Lampasas. It's the smallest county in Texas, and it's nowhere near the border. But he's serious about drug crime. Hurting the cartel by taking their assets away from them is just a benefit to the officers and the department and the citizens of our county and of our state. What are the chances that something inside of one of these lockers was seized through civil asset forfeiture? No, right not, not now, no. Not like we, had, we hadn't done anything like that recently. The sheriff never expected to become a national spokesman for the practice. He says his department only sees his property about three or four times a year. But then this happened. We've got a state senator in Texas that was, was talking about introducing legislation to require conviction 
before we could receive that forfeiture Can money. You believe that? And I told him that the cartel would build a monument to him in Mexico if he could get that legislation. Who's the back. state senator? Do you want to give his name? We'll destroy his career. <laughs> it's unclear who exactly Sheriff Evanson was referring to, but the most comprehensive asset forfeiture reform bill in Texas right now was introduced this past December by State Senator Connie Burton. When you've got something in place that allows government to not only seize, but potentially forfeit their property without a criminal conviction, something is wrong there, and I'm gonna push back because we need to protect the rights of innocent victims. Burton's bill would ban officers from permanently seizing property if the owner hasn't been convicted of a crime. It's created some unlikely alliances. Burton is a member of the Tea Party, but conservative and liberal organizations have both been vocal opponents of civil asset forfeiture for years. Did you expect before coming into office that there would be issues like this where you are very much on the same side as like the ACLU, <laughs> as all these different you know, organizations right. that, that in many ways exist on the complete opposite side of the aisle? Right. So certainly not before my, la my first session, I did not know. But after being here and getting involved in the criminal asset reform issues, it was like, you know, oh my goodness, common ground, that's what it's about. Let's work together and move forward for the good of everyone. One of the biggest concerns for lawmakers like Connie is that the policy incentivizes cops to seize as much as possible. In Texas, police departments usually get to keep most of the cash and the revenue from selling cars. And it adds up. In 2015, Texas collected roughly $53 million from civil asset forfeiture. More than $36 million went to law enforcement agencies. There's a lot of positive things we can do with that money that keeps the citizens of our county and the citizens of our state from having to spend money out of their tax dollars to pay for something that we were able to make the cartel pay for. How would you characterize the difference between what opponents of civil asset forfeiture imagine happens in terms of due process and, and what actually happens? I think it's just the fact that they're uninformed and they've heard stories. I've heard people talk about, well, I know this happened, but when you get them to give you specifics, they can't do that. Wait for it. Mindy can't offer specifics about her car because no one will talk to her about it. The Lampasas district attorney never returned her call. Instead, she heard from her lawyer's office. So Lampasas won't talk to me at all? They said they would not. Okay. And they, want, they made contact with us to call you and let you know that they're not going to speak to you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They won't talk to me because that criminal case is still pending. Even though the judge granted it, technically they haven't dismissed it yet because they're waiting for the DA to see if they appeal it. Why can't they just talk to me? That's my Jeep. Awesome. <laughs> oh, it's so frustrating. Tonight marks the season finale of The Quad, a new BET series that's often compared to Scandal if it was set at an HBCU, or historically black college and university. The first episode alone depicted hazing, sexism, and a college president who sleeps with a student. This might sound like every college TV show ever made, but some leaders of black universities claim the show gives viewers the wrong impression about their schools, resulting in real life consequences. ABC Digest Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Carter, and we're back talking about... For the past seven years, Jared Carter's run HBCU Digest, a publication that reports on the nation's 130 black colleges and their communities. I've had people say on Twitter, when I'm following along and I'm live tweeting with everybody else, when you have an 18 or a 19-year-old who's a freshman at Syracuse saying, this is it, tweeting, this is exactly why I didn't go to an HBCU. Have you seen that? Absolutely. When you have a, a donor say, yep, that's exactly why I'm not giving as much as I can. We have a problem. We are pretending as if art doesn't influence life after imitating it. And that's not true. It's not true. And it's not to say that we want the quad to just completely flip and just show us all the good stuff. We're saying, give us a little bit more about the things that actually go right at these campuses. We can't afford to have the imbalance. That, as a sector, we can't afford to have. You're talking about financially? Yeah, because, I mean, these schools, are they're in real trouble. Man, I'm telling you, they're, in five or ten years, we may lose 10 or 15 campuses. This is, this is not a joke. A lot of the criticism has been aimed at the series' creator, Felicia Henderson. 
She didn't attend an HBCU herself, but she says the show was inspired by the time she visited Howard, an HBCU in Washington, D.C., where she felt immediately at home. She says the show is a drama, and it should be allowed to be a drama. What continues to baffle me is the idea that we should only show us in our best lights, because I think that it is not fair to us, and I think that it is, um, it bugs me. Why is that? For black people, it is important to see themselves on television, and I don't know any perfect black people. So it's not just, <laughs> but it's, it's not just black people watching, right? Mm, I don't think so, but right. predominantly, so I see where you're going. I see where you're going. I'm with you. Let's go there. Yes, absolutely. So what do we want to show white people about black people? Mm -hmm. And this is what I, I feel, is that by saying to white people, we don't want you to see that we are flawed, we are saying to white people, you may continue to not accept us or consider us human. One of the most controversial plot lines involves a rape that takes place on campus. And after that, there's a classroom debate about the meaning of consent. I'm sure you've heard about the recent rape allegations, so let's talk about it. What is consent? Saying yes or no. And no means no. Felicia Henderson says that's one of the parts she's most proud of, but it's also caused a lot of complaints. A friend sent me a, a direct message on Twitter um, because someone had said I was the devil and a hypocrite. He said, how dare you depict black men as rapists? And that's in general what I find the criticisms are all generalities. We're certainly not saying that on black college campuses sexual assault happens more. That's not, if, you, if that's what you took out of it, boy, did you miss the point. Um, but it is an epidemic and a problem at, on college campuses. Let's say somebody's watching this who has no experience, no prior knowledge of HBCU. Yes. What do you think they're gonna take away from the experience of watching the show? I hope that what people would take away is, oh wow, they're not really that different from my college experience. HBCU leaders themselves have been the target of some criticism. In February, over 100 presidents of HBCUs met with Donald Trump as he prepared to sign an executive order promising support for HBCUs. So you criticize the show, mm -hmm. and there's been a lot of other people who criticize the show, a lot of leaders of HBCUs, yeah. and the criticism came very quick. Criticism hasn't been so quick about the Trump administration. We're talking about art that represents a culture and the culture's need to broker with the president of the United States. Um, the truth of the matter is HBCUs will, will, will stop existing if federal funds don't come to our campuses. Has some of his comments been reprehensible? Absolutely. Um, do most HBCU leaders disagree with his politics? Absolutely. But what they don't disagree with is the opportunity for things to get better for our campuses. The Quad isn't paying us. The Quad is not giving one student a loan. The Quad is not giving one student a Pell Grant. The Quad is not awarding one research contract. Trump is. Well, Trump can by way of direction for federal agencies. So basically it comes down to a check and that's his. This is money, man. This is money. On Tuesday, House Republicans voted to repeal an Obama-era FCC rule that would have prevented your internet service provider from selling consumer data, your online activity, aka all of your activity, without telling you first. It may seem like a shocking betrayal of the American public's privacy, but it is a huge win for America's multi-billion dollar telecommunication monopolies. So there's that. With this bill, ISPs would be subjected to the same privacy regulations as Google or Facebook, except they're not the same thing. We already give all of our most precious personal information to websites in exchange for their free services, but we pay our internet service providers a lot, with the expectation that our late nights of webmd fueled self-diagnosis of shingles that also may be cancerous won't be shared with advertisers, unless there's a cure. Now that the bill has passed the House, the future of internet privacy is in a good place, in the capable hands of this brilliant technologist, a man who looks incredibly comfortable in front of a computer and has previously had this to say about using them for anything. If you have something really important, write it out and have it delivered by courier the old-fashioned way. It's a development that even spooked Trump's most fervent supporters, members of the Donald subreddit. 
While many Trump Redditors were apparently busy celebrating too much winning Tuesdays, some of the Donald Troll farm began to quietly panic as they learned of the news, calling for Trump to veto the bill, which he probably won't. Thankfully, at the 11th hour comes a saviour. A robot has just burst onto Twitter that prints out Trump's tweets, sets them on fire, then lets him know. Give us a couple of weeks and that's how we'll all be communicating. That's Vice News Tonight for Wednesday, March 29th.